The scripture reading today comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. Come to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by the people, but he is precious to God, who chose him. And now God is building you as living stones into his spiritual temple. Once more, you, what's more, you are God's holy priests who offer spiritual sacrifices that please him because of Jesus Christ. As the scriptures express it, I'm placing a stone in Jerusalem, a chosen cornerstone, and anyone who believes in him will never be disappointed. Yes, he is very precious to you who believe, but for those who reject him, the stone that was rejected by the builders has now become the cornerstone. And the scriptures also say, he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that will make them fall. They stumble because they do not listen to God's word or obey it, and so they meet the fate that has been planned for them. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are a kingdom of priests, God's holy nation, his very own possession. This is so you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, now you are the people of God. Once you received none of God's mercy, now you have received his mercy. Thanks, Todd. Give me just a second. This week we're going to begin a series, or really it's uh, less than a series, we're going to do a two-week uh, sermon series I've entitled uh, One for All and All for One. This is actually part of the larger series, To Eternity and Beyond, if you've been around. Uh, but this sermon is going to go with next week's as well. And uh, maybe you've heard that title, One for All and All for One. It was the statement of the three musketeers when they would put their swords together and say, here we go, into battle. We represent something greater than ourselves. All for one and one for all. Before we get started, let's pray together this morning. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are in this place. God, as we come away from our weeks we come and we lay our burdens at your feet. We surrender ourselves, Jesus. And we ask you to open up our eyes and our ears that we might really see you and really experience you this morning. Any burdens that we're carrying, God, we ask you to lift them from us now and pour out your grace upon us. God, we ask you to change us from the inside out. We thank you for the cornerstone that was laid for us. And we look to you now, Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Labor Day weekend. Can you believe it's here? Labor Day weekend really marks the end of one season and the beginning of another. It ends the mark, or it marks the end of summer, doesn't it? And so we have one more party, one more exciting thing happen, cookouts or maybe family gatherings, whatever you're going to go to, and maybe Isaac's going to come with you. This year, <laughs> Isaac's brought a lot of rain our way. But uh, whatever the case may be, it's you have a weekend, a long weekend, where you mark the end of summer and the beginning of fall. And as we do that, we look forward to fall and all that God has in store for us, but we also remember the things that we got to do this summer. We enjoy family and friends and cookouts and things one last time. I thought about this weekend and kind of what it means. It made me think about this passage that Todd read for you. And specifically, I, I don't know if you caught it in there, but it, 
it speaks of a cornerstone, and it talks about Jesus being the cornerstone of a building. And if you were to go to the cornerstone, that's really the stone that the foundation is built upon. And a lot of times, or sometimes, there are dates inscribed on cornerstones on the outside of buildings. I think there's one outside our worship center that says this was built in 1972. You might go to other buildings and see a date on them and when they were built. And you see this cornerstone that's the foundation. It's the stone that all the rest of them are built on. And when you look at this cornerstone or you see it and you experience it, you realize that that's when the work was completed. That's when it was finished. And Jesus being our cornerstone, this passage starts out where Peter is talking to a group of people who he says in the first verse of the book of 1 Peter, he says, you're scattered throughout the land. You're scattered to Cappadocia and Bithynia and all these different places, and really you don't have to try to pronounce those. All you have to know is he's saying, you're scattered throughout the land. These are believers but they're not just believers. They're believers who may be experiencing the feeling of being alone, being scattered, being pushed outside of their limits, being drawn away from one another. And not only that, but you find out in the first chapter of First Peter that they're experiencing trials. Here they've come to faith in Christ. They've uh, given their lives to Jesus. They've taken on the reward that he's given in faith. And now they're trying to walk in faith and love and understand what's this Christian life all about. Meanwhile, they're facing trials and struggles and difficulties and questions. I don't know about you, but sometimes when we sit around the dinner to table at my home, sometimes questions come up. How was your day? How are things going? Yes, those kind of questions, but also what are we going to do about this? Or what are we going to do about that? And maybe you come here this morning and you have questions. You see, the people that Peter is writing to are not that different from us. Maybe you come here this morning and you feel alone. Maybe you wonder where the next step is going to be or where you're going to find your hope. And I want you to realize that the Bible is a real-life book that was written to people who were experiencing real-life issues that are not that different from our own. We experience trials too. And so Peter begins the book by saying, I want you to remember the hope that you have in God through Christ, that you are saved by faith in him, and when you hold fast to him, you are secure. And as you walk through this life and you experience trials and struggles and things happening, realize that Christ is the cornerstone. I love this picture that Peter begins to unwrap for us, and I want to look at it with you this morning. There are a few things that he says. This cornerstone, every brick of a building is built upon that cornerstone. That is the beginning place, and it is the ending place. And when you are connected to that cornerstone as a brick of that building, you are secure, and you're surrounded by other bricks, and you're held up. And so Peter draws them back to the cornerstone of their faith. And I want to encourage you as you begin this fall to remember to look back to who Christ is to you. Did you know that the scripture says in the book of John that he is the water that quenches the thirst of our souls? It goes on in the New Testament to say that he is the bread that takes care of the hunger that we have. In fact, I was reading in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 this week, and it reminded me that God has set eternity in everyone's heart. That means we have a longing. We have this desire. There's a famous author who said, uh, C.S. Lewis, maybe you've heard of him. He said, have you ever felt like there's not enough time in a day? <laughs> like there's more you want to do, there's more you want to be, more you want to accomplish, 
And really that's just a picture of this idea that there's more for us, that there's more that we need, that there's more that there is to come. This eternity, that here and now is not the end of the story, it is just part of the journey. And so with that in mind, Peter says that Jesus is the cornerstone. But here's the amazing thing about the cornerstone of a foundation. It's the stone that won't be moved. It's the stone that every brick, like I said just a moment ago, holds to. And it's the foundation that when you are closely connected to it, it will hold you fast. Now, if you were to take away the cornerstone of the foundation, what would happen? It'd all fall down, wouldn't it? But with that cornerstone there, you're secure. Now, here's the thing about the bricks, though, that are connected to a cornerstone. And this is true with you and me and Jesus. We need to be intimately connected with him. And when we say intimately, we mean on a daily basis, on a daily basis talking to him, on a daily basis listening to him, on a daily basis reading his word. The word of God in Hebrews chapter 4 says that it is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. And I love what that means We won't take a long time with this, but it says it can cut down through any layer. You don't have to worry about unpacking all of the stuff you're carrying. You don't have to concern yourself with cleansing yourself. No, just open up the Word of God and begin to let Him speak to you. That's what it really means to have a relationship with Jesus. A daily relationship where you rely on Him. Our security, we bring up this word a lot. You know, on the internet, we want to be secure from things that come from the outside world, right? Nobody wants their credit card number stolen when you buy things online. Nobody wants to be taken advantage of from a scam or anything like that. One of the things that we really desire is security. And the amazing thing about God is that he tells us that not only can we look to him, not only can we run to him, not only can we give our burdens to him and he'll give us a burden that's light, but he is the one place where not only can we experience security, but we can be built in security. As we allow the love of God to pour into our hearts and to our minds and to renew those thoughts that we've carried with ourselves about the past or renew those thoughts that we get from our friends or our coworkers or the things, I'll tell you what, experiences in my life, let's just be honest, go back to the trials for a minute. I cannot tell you how many times I can allow maybe uh, what I would call, we talked about being in the construction zone last week, you remember that? I cannot begin to tell you how a storm in my life or a detour or something I've experienced, whether with a friend or a family member, can make me begin to think thoughts that aren't really true about what matters in life. And so when we come back to Jesus as the cornerstone, when we rely on him, that reminds us of what he's done for us on the cross, that the penalty's been paid. It reminds us that we are now covered in his righteousness, When we come back to that cornerstone and we are connected to him on a daily basis, this is not about checking off your do's and don'ts list. It's about connecting with the Savior who saves you. You realize that? We begin to get cleansed. But there's something else that this passage goes on to tell us. It says that this is a cornerstone that we can hold to, that this is a cornerstone that's secure and that when we hold to it we won't be shaken the winds might blow things might happen but we'll be okay this past week um, we had a I guess it was last week we had a storm where hail fell so much at our house it covered the ground to being white anybody have that happen and I wasn't home but when I did get home my wife said wow that was trouble (laughs) I mean, it was really blowing and the wind was really, uh, the wind and rain was coming and we were a little nervous, so we went to the basement. And why do we go to the basement? We need to get back down to the foundation. We need to get where we're secure. We don't want to look out the windows. We don't want the windows to blow in at us. We want to get to the foundation. 
And really, when we talk about the cornerstone of Christ, and why should we bring this up on a consistent basis, it's this. God wants you to get underneath the foundation of his love. He wants you to get underneath, underneath the foundation of his grace. He wants you to be secure in there so that the rest of this passage can happen. Because now what is the rest of it that happens? It says that we won't be shaken. In fact, we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation being built by God. There's a few things that happen here. The cornerstone of a foundation is so important, but the other stones that are connected to it are what give it shape and beauty. Hear me, Mount Tabor. As you get ready to go into the fall, realize that God has a specific purpose for you. And that you and I together can display God's glory. And I don't want you to let this be a word out there that we don't really understand or it's hard to realize what is glory. That really means that you put God's presence on display. That in you the light of Christ shines. That when you are built, being built, that you as a brick of God's building he delights in you, Zephaniah chapter 3.17 says. He says that you are saved by grace through faith and that God has works for you to do. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10 says, when we trust in Christ, did you know that God has works set for you to do? That he wants you to participate with him. That the beauty of God's glory, that his presence, that the light of who he is can shine through you. This is very important. Not only does God want us to be connected to him, but I have to say to you, I think sometimes we can think so much about what's happened to us or our weaknesses or uh, what our friends or not our friends might say about us or what's happened in the past. But yet God comes along and says, I have called you by name. I have a specific purpose for you. I have a plan for your life. And as he says that to you, this is not just about going back to the foundation, but it's being built. And I want you to realize this, that brick by brick by brick, God puts us together. And so it says that we are a holy temple. Now I want you to realize this. In the ancient times, the temple was one place where everybody went. Okay? But now he says that you and I together as we walk, as the body of Christ, as we are working together, we're the temple of God, that he lives inside of us. Did you ever realize that in uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says this, I've been cruci crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I now live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The life I now live, I don't live for myself. I live it to God. And the amazing thing is that we, as we move out from these walls, as we move out into our world, that God says, you can be the flashlight that will show somebody to me. You can be, with all of your weaknesses, with all of the things that you have going on, here's the amazing thing. When we allow our weaknesses to shine but tell what God has done through us, this is what Jesus says in 2 Corinthians. He says that when you show your weakness, it allows the power of Christ to shine through you. It isn't about what we have, it's about what Jesus has done for us. It isn't about what we can do, but what's already been done. That's the amazing news of the gospel, amen? But this building, I want you to notice a couple of things. First it says that we are priests. Now, this word, I just kind of want to unpack that for you. When it's talking about priests, the priests in the Old Testament were set apart. They were given the object, given the ability and the understanding through their relationship with God to be set apart so that people might know God through them. And so really what this passage is saying is you. And it's not about your education. It's not about what skills you have, or anything like that. There's no qualifications. Did you ever notice that in this passage? It only says that all of us are priests. And what that means is it's been, you've been set apart by God to display Christ to a living world, really to a world that needs him. 
And I'm amazed as you go into your workplace, as you go into the school, as you just allow Christ to shine through you, you are to be set apart to him. But I want to give you two things this week to think about. First of all, I have to realize that uh, I put my Ohio State hat on yesterday, or I wanted to. I guess I didn't, huh, Amy? But I wanted to. Why? Because it was Ohio State's first game, right? You have to know I'm a big Buckeyes fan. I'm going to just let that out. I don't say how many teams I represent and things like that, but I'm, I am. I'm, I'm a Buckeyes fan. So I usually want to pull out my hat and pull out my sweatshirt. Now, when I lived in Pennsylvania, a mile from State College, Pennsylvania, or, you know, from Penn State's campus, I had to keep it in the drawer because they would beat me up. You know what I mean? And they had some big football players there. <laughs> you can imagine. So, but now, you know, I pulled it out every once in a while. But here's the thing. When we put on the clothes, a hat or a sweatshirt or something, what are we doing? We're identifying with the team that we represent, don't we? We say, I want to be part of that team. I want to be a part of what they're doing. I want to be excited about them. And here's the amazing thing, that this passage tells us that we've been now clothed in Christ. It isn't about us working to be saved, just allowing his work to flow through us. And that when we put on his clothes, we represent him, not by everything that we try to do for him, but just by allowing our words and our actions to make him known. And so when I put on a sweatshirt or a hat that's a Buckeye's, Uh, that lets you know that I identify with them. And I have to say to you this morning, what clothes do you wear into your workplace? What clothes do you wear into where you go? Do you allow the righteousness of Christ to be what you carry? Do you allow the robes that God has given you? Do Do you realize that it says that you, in doing that, you are given his special righteousness? No longer do you have to work. You just have to have a trust in him. Set apart. But here's the other thing. It says that you are a part of a holy nation. You see, I'm not just one brick in this structure. I'm not just the only one. But it's you and you and you and you. And together with who we are through the things that we say and the things that we do. We are a holy nation unto God. God is building his kingdom all around the world, and he says to each one of us, come and be a part of it. Come and remember what I've done for you. Come and be made new. I love it. And God is calling each one of you. I heard I live just over the hill from the football stadium. And uh, when we came home late uh, Friday night, I wasn't able to go to that game. But when I came home, the uh, crowd was cheering so loud that my boys couldn't go to sleep. It was like 1030. The band was playing real loud. All of a sudden, Jonathan comes in our room and says, hey, I can't sleep. That's it. Forget it. That, that's kind of how he talked. You know, he's just straightforward like I am. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to sleep. So that's a whole other sermon. But, uh, <laughs> but uh you have to realize the band, as, as a player was making a great pl- play, the uh, crowd cheered louder. You know, and the band began to play, and wow, they were excited. And the amazing thing about a football game, if watch it next time, is that as you cheer, what happens? The team works harder, don't they? They run faster. They, they begin to get encouragement and strength from each other. And the same thing is true in the church. You see, Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the center of the faith. He's the one who gives us the energy and the strength. But I have to say to you this morning, here in 2012, that God wants us to be connected to one another, to take the time and the energy to walk through life with each other, to cheer each other on, to encourage each other. Jesus says this in John chapter 13 and verse 35, this is how the world will know Uh, that we're his disciples, how we love one another. So we're meant to encourage each other. We're meant to push each other. I want you to look around the room when you get a chance this morning and just see who's next to you and realize that we're meant to do this together. And as we do this brick by brick by brick and we move out from here, we can change the world.
because the power of Christ lives in us. Now I want to take you back to the cornerstone and then we're going to go to communion quickly. The cornerstone on a building, if you look out here, like I said, it says 1972. It marks the date and time of the completion. So it'll take you back in your faith journey when you look at it to what Jesus has done for you. And I want to say to you, if you need your gas tank filled this morning, you can go no better place than to the foot of the cross. You can go no better place to find security and know you are loved than into Jesus' presence itself. But at the same time, I want to encourage you as you're going through the journey, I want you to think in your heart and your mind as you come to get communion, what is the last date of a trial that I've experienced? Maybe it's right now. Maybe it would be today's date. And I want you to etch that in your mind and realize that that trial, Peter goes on to say that through every trial that we experience, we're being built we're being fashioned. We're being molded. We're being refined, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8 says. That through every trial, God displays his grace and his presence to us, and not only us, to people around us. And so really, whatever you're experiencing this morning, whether it's a small thing like, what do I do with this next detail, or it's the crisis of walking into a hospital room, or maybe it's a family member, whatever it might be, did you realize that this might be the next date when you remember God's grace and mercy to you? Right now, you might be thinking, I can't understand why I have to go through this. I can't understand how this ha why this has to happen. But God says, in my mercy, you will experience my grace and my power. So I want you to take, I want to encourage you as you come to the communion table this morning to bring whatever you have. Bring whatever you have. Because God is the one who makes us into a royal priesthood. God is the one who sets us apart. God is the one who makes us a holy nation. And what we need to do is walk by faith and surrender to him and say, yes, Lord. And as we do that, God will take every good and every bad thing and work it to draw us closer to him and to know him. So whatever it might be, and give it to him. And know that he will carry your burden for you. As we lock our swords together this fall, and we live a life of all for one and one for all, because there was one that was given for all of us, we display through our words and our actions a grace that the world is dying to know. And at the same time, we fill up our hearts in that place where we want to know that there's more. Where God has set eternity in our hearts. This morning as you come to the communion table. Will you experience God's grace afresh? And will you know that you have been set apart to be his? Let's pray. Lord God I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your presence in this place. I thank you for Labor Day. And what it signifies. Uh, Lord a resting from our work. And one more day as we look forward to the new season that's ahead. Maybe right now we are in a transition from moving to the summer to the fall in other areas of life. Maybe we uh, come here carrying burdens. Wherever we're at this morning, God, may we remember that you are the cornerstone that we can cling to. That our lives can rest in your grace. And may we display to the world around us, just by being yours, the light and the love of Christ. Draw us close to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to